Welcome everyone. My name is Marina, Marina Gandlin. Uh, I work in Tabula for almost four years and I'm a team lead in the Algo group, in the data science uh, group in Tabula. And today what I'm going to do is show you a little trick we use almost all the time uh, in our production systems. And um, what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit simplified from what it really looks like in our production system, but uh, hopefully you'll get the gist and uh, I think we're ready to start. Okay, so Miri already mentioned it, but I think I'll go over it again, uh, this time in English. So what do we do in Tabula? So even if you've never heard of us, you must have seen us before, because Tabula today um, is on probably the world's, the world's biggest publishers. Uh, we can see a list of them here, NBC, AOL, the BBC, Bloomberg, and we're on these pages because we are uh, curating items to be displayed on these pages in a personalized manner. What does that mean? Um, usually at the bottom or at the middle of the pages that you open, when you open Bloomberg or Ynet, uh, you see uh, some items like images and, and titles uh, under the title more for you or recommended for you or you might be interested in and these are items that we place there uh, live in production and again personalized for you. So for publishers the service we do is we put related articles from these publishers in their network um, so that they can enjoy more engagement and more user time on their website. And we also put in sponsored items, which is advertisement. And the publishers use the money made from these advertisements to uh, keep their website going on and open outside of subscription walls. So for, for advertisers, like any place where you see advertisements, we help grow their crowd and bring uh, new traffic to their websites. And for users, we allow you to have a better, more personalized uh, sense of uh, more personalized environment to read on your favorite websites. And we even do this outside of the publishers you read. Uh, we also have a product called Tabula News, which is much like Google Now or Apple News, where we aggregate items from different publishers we work with to give you a personalized feed every day. So if, if um, my first explanation wasn't enough, what we do here is very, very large scale recommendation systems. And what do I mean by large scale? Um, think of the moment where you click Ynet, C-O-I-L, on your, on your browser. And just imagine that this URL request goes to a Tabula server. And what it brings back before the page is loaded is a bunch of items that are personalized for you to read. Some of them are from Ynet, some of them are uh, ads. And we get that request about half a million times every second, okay? From, from Bloomberg, from Ynet, from the BBC, from a bunch of publishers. And we have to give back a list of items uh, in the time frame of 20 milliseconds, okay? So this is, the, this is the production beast that we're in charge of. And for a recommendation system, what we have to do is give recommendations for about one and a half billion people monthly, billion users, unique users monthly. And what we have to choose from is about 10 million items every month. And as you can imagine, we have something like 100,000 new items every day, new articles from all the publishers in all the languages we work in. So very, very large scale recommender systems, what we call tabula scale. And to face this very, very challenging problem, uh, we have our magical algo uh, group which is today 55 data scientists in Israel, about 20 more in Taiwan and in LA. And we process, to solve this, we process 100 terabytes daily. And, and we design deep learning models to help us face this question. And then we distribute them in the Tabula data centers over, in over 20,000 dockers with models. So this is really a, a production beast. And we try to get better at it every day because better accommodations means a, a better experience for you and more uh, allowance for our publishers. So this is the scene. So let's start. Okay, any questions? Okay, cool. 
So advertisers, what do they want uh, and who are they? So Tabula advertisers are very, very, very diverse from uh, Schufersal to uh, other websites and car agencies and game developers. And when they put an ad on a publisher, uh, when they pay somebody to show an ad, they basically want different things. And it really depends on what you're advertising. So if you're, a, if you're a website, what you really want is more traffic, new traffic, subscriptions. If you're a car agency, you want to sell more cars, have people purchase cars. And if you're a game developer, what you really want is for them to install it on their phone. And so one of the things we predict in Tabula, and specifically in my team, is whether uh, a certain user is going to have some kind of engagement after he clicks on an ad. So what we're really trying to figure out whether there's going to be something post-click or not. So one or zero, and hopefully that clicks, because this is a classification problem, right? We have a user reading some kind of article in Ynet, at two o'clock uh, in the afternoon, and I'm showing him an ad about cars. Is he going to click? And is he going to purchase a car after he clicks? So how do we rank? Easy. We have uh, an online prediction machine. Uh, and when you guys type ynet.co.il, a uh, request goes from your computer to a Tabula server, and it has inside some user features, like the time, whether you're on desktop, on mobile, things like that. And uh, the context features, like what are you reading? What's the title of the web page you're trying to open? And on our servers, we have a list of candidates. Ad, ad number one, ad number two, ad number three. And we take their ad features, right? The title of the ad, who's the advertiser, what's the image? And we send it to one single DL model, deep learning model. And that deep learning model outputs uh, a probability uh, for some post-click engagement, okay? So I want you guys to remember that this is a single model because it's easier that way. What we do, we shuffle the ads we get according to their post-click probability and we show the top K results. And when you scroll down, you're gonna see the first and then the second and then the third one, okay? So how do we train a model that does such a thing? Uh, easy, <laughs> we, everything is easy. We build a data set and basically each row is a request, right? The same request we talked about earlier with the context feature, the user features and the ad features. And our label, our, our, our target is whether we had some kind of post-click uh, engagement or we didn't, like zero or one. And one thing we need to notice here is that the post-click types are very, very different, right? We talked about what the user, what the advertiser wants. Some of these post-click are app installs, and some of these post-clicks are car purchases. Okay. Uh, um, I hope you guys understand that some rows, some types of post-click conversions are we see more often than, than others, right? So app installs we see a lot and car purchases, not as many. So we looked at the model and uh, yeah, the, the accuracy is pretty good. It's online and everything looks fine. But then we decided to drill a little bit deeper and see that for app installs, we're, we're really doing really well. Like the, we look at the, the ROC, the AUC score, and it's really, really nice. But when we look at the car purchases, our ability to classify whether somebody's going to buy a car or not is really not, not that good. Much less than what we do for app installs. And it's pretty easy to figure out why, right? The majority of our data comes from this category. So the weights we learn are fitted for this case and not so much for the car purchases. So what do we do? We have a data set and it's highly skewed what can we do? So option number one would be to downsample, right? Easy, I just take uh, a small amount of my app installs and I try to build a model that's balanced. I have the same amount of app installs as I have for car purchases. So what could be wrong with that? Small data set, yeah, it's a very, very small data set. And instead of making the car purchases better, I made the app installs worse. 
So not good. So the opposite of uh, downsampling is data augmentation. Augmentation. I can take my car purchases rows and I can duplicate them. I can maybe do some fancy uh, um, noising on them. And I, I might get a somewhat upsampling, yeah. Uh, okay, so I meant if, if anybody is confused by this term, I meant upsampling, okay? Um, I will get more rows, but I'm not sure I'm going to get a better model because I don't know if these rows are just, they, they represent something real, like real requests that happened in the real world. world. Uh, another option is to weigh the loss, right? This is a, the, like a classical suggestion. If 80% of my data set is population A, I can uh, downweigh the loss for these rows and put a higher weight on the population I want to strengthen. So we were sure this is, this is going to work. We tried a lot, a lot, a lot of weights, a lot of functions, and this always failed. <laughs> Um, and then we started thinking, maybe we should just do two separate models. So I present solution number one. Two different models. I'm going to split the data set. The top rows are going to be just rows that have app install conversions and their negative counterparts. And the bottom data set is going to be just car purchases and their negative counterparts. So what's wrong with this solution? Ah, I have. Like this is a very simplified uh, architecture, which I'm going to use a lot during this talk. So it's basically features that go into dense nets, dense layers, a lot of them. They output a logit, and if I put that logit in a sigmoid, I get the probability for a post click. Okay. So let's get back to w what is wrong with two different models. So a lot of things are wrong. Um, just like with the downsampling, I basically get one very very small data set. So if I want to train a very large model on it, uh, it's just going to be bad. And with the second point is if I train two models and I output two scores, comparing them like I did when I want to rank uh, is actually not a good idea if they're not calibrated pretty well. Um, this is like a, a, calibration model, uh, a calibration problem. It means I need to train two different uh, models, which is not that heavy on the pipeline if I only have two, but if I have a large amount, that's, that's pretty bad. Um, then serving is, is, a, is pretty much a nightmare because instead of sending all the ads to one single model that outputs one single score for each, I need to route, route each advertisement to a different model and then bind their scores. And some of them have different running, running times uh, it's really a bad idea in production. And the worst of all, and this is like a major part, when I split the data sets, I get no generalization, right? Our models are supposed to learn a lot of things, not only about the ad, about the user, and about the interaction in, with the context, but these two models are going to need to learn it separately with no co-learning between them. So I get the specialization I wanted, but I don't get any generalization. So, booze. Okay? So that brings us to solution number two. And our inspiration here was something that's called a two-headed model. Raise your hand if you're familiar with the concept, heard of it. Okay. What? Like multitask learning. Exactly. Multitask learning. So what is a two-headed model? I put my features into one single model. I have some dense layers that are shared, but then I have some dense layers that are split between two tasks. Uh, usually there are different tasks um, and it's calculated simultaneously. So a popular use for this architecture is probably um, inputting an image and I have one head that classifies whether this is a dog or a cat and the other head, uh, head um, uh, returns the, the bounding box. Okay, so two different outputs from a single input. So this sounds like a good idea, right? We get the generalization we wanted, we get the specific specification we wanted, but it doesn't really fit what we're trying to solve here, right? I don't have two different tasks. I just want one number to be outputted. But we tried it anyway. <laughs> 
So this is the two-headed model that fits the problem I described earlier. We have some dense layers that are shared. We have some dense layers that are split. And I output two numbers. And I just pick the one that fits me. I look at the features. I know which conversion, which post-click action I'm looking for. And I just pick one of them for the, for the loss. So in training, I only take one to calculate the loss with. Um, and if, if I do this uh, in prediction, in, in production, uh, I need to choose one. So it's a little more complicated, but not that bad, right? I can deal with choosing one score from a lot of scores. But we wanted something different that makes it a little bit easier. So it's basically one more tweak and that's it. So we call this the gated two-headed model. And it starts off exactly the same like our previous slides, but it includes the choice of which logic, which output I take inside the model. Okay? So I build in two gates. That's either zero or one. And if the top one is one, the other one is zero. And the formula for the gate, for the top one, is it's gonna be one if the conversion is an app install, and otherwise it's gonna be zero, okay? So if that was too quick, we also have an example. So imagine a request comes in, and it's an advertiser that develops a game, and we know the post-click we're looking for is an app install. So the top gate becomes one, the bottom gate becomes zero. When I do the forward propagation, I stop here because I mul multiply the output by zero, and what I get outside is the logic for the app install. Nice and easy. When I do the back propagation, uh, the top specialized weights get trained. They get the gradients through them. And, and so does these weights. But those, one, those ones only get trained where we, are, where we have rows that are app install. Okay, I'm gonna do it again for car purchase. When we train, when we forward propagate, the, the top gate is gonna be zero, the bottom gate is gonna be one, and the output is gonna be the logic for the car purchase. The reason we're using it is if the app won't be installed, there's no point of talking about the car purchase. So the, the advertiser, the, the advertisement is for an app. Yeah, so basically if, if the app doesn't, won't be downloaded, it's, it's really just speeding the bus. Yeah, we don't care about the probability for a car purchase on an ad for, for an app. Okay. Okay? So what do we get with this final very nice and easy architecture? We get generalization at the weights that are shared. We get specialization with the weights that have degrees of freedom for a special type of post-click. And we get a single output, which means we can send all the ads through one uh, model in production and uh, not overcomplicate stuff. So one model to rule them all. Geeky joke here. So this is super useful. Like um, the the history of this thing is that we really we 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 really did discover it on a very similar scenario to here. But then once we had this architecture, we are using it in a bunch of places. And it's like a, a poor man's version of a mixture of experts, if you guys know the Google uh, paper. So it works on any kind of uh, heterogeneous data set. Like if you can bucket your data set rows into not that, high, uh, not that high amount of categories, I would say 10, 15 works fine, depending on the size of your data set. And we have now a bunch of different use cases for it. Uh, sometimes we use it to mix uh, different geos, like if I'm using a model to learn something about uh, ads in the English language. Uh, but I think that ads in the, different, in, in the English language are kind of different between uh, English-speaking countries, like Australia and New Zealand. So we use this. And then we figured out that we actually don't need anything to be different. We can just use it as an ensemble learning. And we just randomly go 
on the top branch for the odd requests and the, and the bottom branch for the even requests. And that works nice like an ensemble learning with the same set. So that's it. <laughs> so the final takeaways here is that we have a nice model that's very simple to, to implement that does both generalization very well, just as well as the early version of this model. But it, only, uh, but it also gives us some specializations for our minority uh, populations in the data set. Uh, it fits perfectly into our production schema because uh, it's a single model and it outputs just a single score for each ad. And of course, we, we demonstrated here for two, but it works perfectly for ends, I, I would say up to 15, depending on the, the size of the, the net. So yay. <laughs> um, do I have time for questions? Um, so I'm trying to understand the difference between the last two models you present. I think the difference just in the backward propagation that is done for both sort of the cases. So it, the, the difference is the, the single output. That's the, it's just a tiny tweak, but it makes a lot of sense in our production. And it means calculating the loss doesn't need any other trick. Because if you would implement it manually, you would need to choose one and then calculate the loss only on it. It's very similar to multi-class uh, classification, if you, in um, Mitzalcha. But they're very similar. Like, th there's no uh, architectural insight between two and three. It's just easier in production. Yeah. Uh, when you said you're you're using it for up to 15 categorical, so you meant one categorical with 15 different class, or yes. but let's say like in this case you had like a, a two population, one uh, from two different countries, and also you had the different uh, category where it's either a power purchase or a app install. So how do you combine? So we, we don't, we don't. We just imagine you have one column in your data set that has say eight categories and we build it for that one. We, we don't combine languages and ad types with the same. We, we might be able to, but we don't do it uh, for now. We just do it on one category. To pick one categorical yeah. variable where you can split it? Yes. And how do you pick which one is the best? So it depends who do we want not to be unfair for. Okay, so like you can imagine that advertisers that advertise cars, they, they're willing to pay a lot for putting their ad on their website. So we want to make sure we're fair towards them so they'll continue to advertise. Do you have some quality score? Something like I'm not sure what is a quality score. But, uh, but not all the uh, publishers are equal. Yes, but this is irrelevant. <laughs> the uh, loss function So th this is a question unrelated. So it's a good production question, but unrelated to this lecture. Yeah. Uh, you said it takes uh, 10 to 15 categories. Uh, what if you have a higher kind of value like that? Uh, 100 or 200? We haven't tried. Did we try, Ruben? Okay, well, <laughs> uh, I mean, this uh, in specific use cases when uh, you really want to make a difference between two populations, three populations, but otherwise there is a memory, uh, uh, memory footprint that we will not be able to form. So Ruben says do not try this with more than 15 categories. <laughs> If I cluster them and then I have 15 buckets? Now if you can train a network, it gives you a network that classifies. So it's all You said at the beginning of the talk that you shuffle the recommendations. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Because you have a uh, rating for the recommendation so you can start from what? sorry so you asked about the shuffling yeah we we output candidates with a random order and we want to shuffle them uh, we want to sort them sorry sort them according to the score they get outputted from the model yeah so from the top score to the yeah did i say shuffle i meant sort yeah, i meant sort yeah that's a good 
דביר.